last week, last week we lost the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I say the best way to honor somebody who has passed away is to embody all the good things that they stood for. So, all the, the, the activism, her civil rights, her human rights activism, her perseverance, her desire to stay alive and keep working until the last possible second. Also, her ability to be friends with people who she disagreed with. All of those things are wonderful things, pieces of her personality that, um, that we should all take away and you know, in order to honor her memory. Um, in that spirit, I am going to issue some honest critiques tonight. I'm going to turn the critique lens on myself and look at some of my older work with, a, with an honest eye, uh, write some, you know, dissents, like she wrote a lot of dissents on the Supreme Court, um, and I'm going to do that right now here in the storage racks. And then after this critique session, at 7 o'clock, I'm going to do the same thing with other people's work for the Akron Society of Artists for their regular Thursday night critique section by Zoom. If you want to join in on that, you can watch it. Um, all the pieces have been submitted already that I'm going to be talking about. But uh, if you want to watch that, go to my website, judytapas.com, and all the Zoom login info will be there. They can have 100 people on, on it, you know, watching. So I don't think we'll hit that. So um, watch that if you, uh, if you so desire. And then to honor Ruth Bader Ginsburg in November, I'm going to vote my butt off and make sure that her legacy of civil rights, women's rights, and human rights does not die with her. So thank you for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. This is the 26th episode and tonight's episode is called Critical Condition. Living Figuratively is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not? Fill your home with figurative art. Each week I talk about my own work or I talk about work from my collection and show you how I decorate my home with it. Past two weeks we've been in my storage room, which is not, you know, a pretty place that I've decorated, but it's also fun to see the little bit of the behind the scenes thing. And, um, and if you are an art collector who is, has more pieces than you can fit onto your, uh, onto your walls, it's also a good thing to have a rotating collection. Keep some in storage, bring them out, change them up, switch them out, bring more back into storage. It's one way to go. It's, you, art is not forever on your walls. It can, you know, come in and out. So, last week I brought you into storage. This week I'm gonna show you what's in my storage. These racks are what I had, I had our builder augment from the, the studs of our home um, in the eaves. And these racks, these storage racks are where I keep old paintings that for some reason, you know, I've, I'm not hanging or haven't sold or represent a significant time in my artistic development or might have sentimental value even if they're not the greatest. Um, and sometimes I will stick paintings in here that are in between shows or like if I've just finished it and they need to dry and wait for the varnish or if they haven't been entered in shows yet. Um, and I keep some of my very old work which I've gradually been culling and culling and culling but there's some old pieces that have stuck around because they you know have sort of special special value or significance. So the first piece that I'm going to show you today and I'm going to pull these out, and I have not previously, I've picked which ones I'm going to do, but I haven't looked at them or decided what I'm going to say necessarily about the pieces themselves, but I will give you some background about them. Um, this is the first piece that we're going to talk about. Okay, this is a painting that I did in 1983 in art school. Um, when I was severely under the influence of Egon Schiele. Egon Schiele, I had just discovered that past summer in Vienna, 
It, um, I stumbled into a museum that I didn't even know existed. I think it's called the Leopold Museum, where works by Egan Schiele were, and he is a phenomenally good draftsman. I love his negative space. I love the way he draws. It's very expressive, but it's it shows good draftsmanship too. It's not just expressive where, oh, I'm scrawling and it's expressive. You can tell he knows exactly how to draw. And um, so for that reason, I just was obsessed with his work and it affected my drawing for, you know, for years afterwards in illustration and in, you know, life drawing class, which I went to obsessively. So um, coming back from from that, one of the very first things that I did was sign up for, this was in my junior year in uh, art school, was sign up for a figure drawing course or a figure painting course by um, an, a guest instructor from Italy who I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember his name. But back then, it was the time of figurative art and realistic art blight. Um, so anytime there was something that was figurative and like a figurative instructor, even if he wasn't very realistic, I was, I was totally on board and I, I signed up for it. So this class that I signed up for, the instructor was a big fan of the artist Balthus. So Balthus is, he, he's also a figurative artist and actually I just found out because I researched him again today, he died in 2005, so, or I'm sorry, 2001. Um, so he's been around, he was born in 1908, so he was a, literally a contemporary artist who just died like 20 years ago. And when this instructor um, told me about Balthus, this is, this is um, I, you know, I started to research him and everything. And uh, remember, it was the time of figurative art blight. I don't think Balthus is the best painter in the world necessarily, but his, his, um, let's see, his, his paintings, you know, they were, they were fairly realistic and not super duper realistic and they were figurative. And so at that time, the pickings were slim. So I was, uh, I became a little bit interested in Balthus. Now, this instructor set up this pose right here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of a Balthus type pose. And I kind of, I ha also have a sort of a tricky relationship with Balthus. His, his work, some of the, this is kind of an example of some of his work. It's like a Balthus pose where it's, it's prepubescent girls that are in these provocative, kind of underwear showing kind of positions. And um, they're not empowered womanhood. They're, they, they, they definitely, they, they try to be sort of ambiguous and quizzical and everything like that, but they also pander to the pervs that, you know, that like that kind of stuff. And so I feel like I'm, I'm not, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't like that. Um, I also don't think that Balthus is the best painter in the world. But at the time, 1983, like I said, pickings were slim. Um, so this instructor set up this Balthus-inspired pose with an adult woman. It was She wasn't prepubescent, she wasn't a child. And um, had her sitting there with this underwear, underwear showing kind of thing. And the painting that I put together was basically inspired by, you know, the, like the line aspect of it was Egon Schiele inspired, and then the pose was the Balthus inspired pose. So I'm gonna look at the, the formal aspects of this painting, um, where I think I actually really like the composition. The, it's got, she's sort of built into this abstract composition. I know that there was a, a chair and things set up and everything, but I've never been about, you know, painting the whole scenery um, thing I really prefer focus on the figure um, I like the way that I did her face um, I love this one knee that's coming out I think that I did a you know a pretty darn good job with that and I like the way that I combined the lines with the um, with the modeling 
So there's some modeling, but there's also a definite line. And that's a tricky, tricky, um, you know, no pun intended, a tricky line to toe is where you have the outlines, but then you also have some rendering and modeling in it. The painting is called Yes and No. And at the time, I named, I'm not sure what I named it when I first painted it, whether I was even naming things back then, but I named it because this show, this was in a show back, I wanna say in 2009, at the, um, at the Valley Art Center called Venus and V. And I had 10 pieces in that show, which I was you know, thrilled to have so many figurative works in a show. I feel that the name Yes and No is really pretty darn appropriate because Yes, it's a good painting, but no, maybe it shouldn't have been painted. It just, it just kind of toes that, that creepy line that nowadays, if uh, I was in a, draw, a group drawing session where the instructor set up a pose that had this kind of woman as child thing going on, I would raise my hand and say, you know what, this isn't, this isn't cool. We're not gonna do this. So, but I'm keeping it because it's a point in time and a memory of a painting that I did. Now I'm gonna pull out and show you a painting that at the time was the best thing that I ever did. And for years, it was actually the best thing that I ever did. Ooh, you can tell I haven't even, it's pretty dusty. So you can tell I haven't even looked at it for maybe 10 years, not since we moved in here. So this painting, oops, and I forgot to stabilize the easel, so it's a little tilty. Um, this painting was done in Massachusetts. One of the, under the, the with the instructor, Berta Golani, one of the things that I've always done in order to keep my skills up and just because I love it, is even when I didn't have a studio of my own, which I didn't in Massachusetts, I kind of had a spare bedroom that I tried to pile up things in, but um, I would take life drawing and life painting classes. And for the time that we lived in Massachusetts, which was six years, I did every Monday night a figure painting class with Berta Golani. Berta Golani, you can look her up on Wikipedia, she's there. Um, she was a bit, she, her work was very different from mine. Hers was very colorful, very color-based, very expressive, some figurative, not realistic whatsoever and really all, all, all about the color. And a lot of it was abstract and swirly and everything, but she had a figure course that was very close to my house. I went every Monday night to the Cambridge Adult Ed Center and painted, knew that there would be a model for me. So, um, and she, wa she was somewhat instructive for me and also somewhat let me kind of do my own thing. But, one of her criticisms was always, whenever she came around to talk to me, she wanted me to add more color, even if I didn't see the color, like make the color more expressive. I was always wanted, wanting to draw it accurately and do value and use the, the, value, the value scale um, with the light and the shade and everything. And if, so I feel like this painting maybe made both of us happy because if, value if if the color the correct colors or the colors also happen to model the form then you know that like made both of us happy essentially uh there was no you know coming out of the darkness and having the nice you know rich brown rembrandt shadows or anything like that in her class like it just got kind of critiqued out of you i guess um but it was also very good to think about because I have a whole slew of colorful works from that time period. And it taught me how to manage, manage color. Maybe that's why I use some of my super bright background colors now. Um, so let's give this one a formal critique. It's still, I think, a very good painting. I love how I, it's kind of splashy down here and then I've got things going on a little bit more um, you know, more realistically up here. I think her neck is probably a little too thick, but I've always loved how I did her face. Um, the color 
and the the value like looking at it from the lens of how I would paint it now is completely different. I would definitely concentrate more on getting the value value patterns and the darks less jumpy. That's always one of my one of my problems and maybe the influence from this class makes my darks jumpy. But um, the, your, if your darks have different values in them and there's like lighter darks in the darks and there's darker lights in the lights, then the whole thing has a jumpiness to it. So this definitely has a jumpiness to it, but I'm not super bothered by it because I feel like the color distribution throughout is really pretty darn good. Even though these, add up to they're not you know flesh tones per se but it's a lot of colors that add up to flesh tones this is probably too strong there probably should be a third color in between there to i'm going to cover up the nipple a little bit just in case but there probably should be a third color in there to to model that form a little bit better that knee is quite lovely i love it um and e even these you know, the, the simple, simple wrinkles in the fabric are good. Um, the background might be just a little too contrived, wishy-washy pastel colors. Uh, that's kind of my sensibility. I, if I were doing it again, I might even do brighter colors in the background. Um, but this is also, oh, and you know what? This is gorgeous. That I love. That's the kind of painting that I, you know, you, you kind of hope for. It's the colors just kind of chop down and, and they really do kind of say a round head there. Um, so that's my critique of this piece. I'm going to put it back in the, put it back in the racks. Now that it's been dusted. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a gander a little bit further down. Let's see, where did I? Oh, okay, here we go. All right. So I'm going to pull out these two pieces, which were done in Lou Grasso's portrait class at the Orange Art Center. And in case you don't remember who Lou Grasso is, it's this gentleman right here, and maybe he's watching tonight. Hi, Lou. Um, this, he was the instructor, and he posed for us one time because we, you know, badly, badly requested him to pose for us because he's so fun to, so fun to paint. He didn't really stop talking when he was posing, but it was still very fun to paint him. So back then, like I said, I had, this was sort of in the coming back to painting time period after 10 years of having a graphic design business and then baby making. Um, I wanted to have regular opportunities to paint people. So I signed up for classes. And every Monday at the Orange Art Center, I signed up for life drawing with George Cosman. And in the afternoon, I had portrait painting with Lou Grasso. So for Lou Grasso's classes, um, he would have a portrait model for like a three week session, sometimes four week session, and then have another one after that. And if it was a long, particularly long semester, then we'd have a third one after that. So like each model would pose for three weeks. One of the things that I would do to sort of test my painting skills and to come up with more complex paintings. So it's not just like, oh, here's another 18 by 24 head and shoulders. Here's another 18 by 24 head and shoulders. What I would do is I would paint one model. Let's say, okay, let's say this one right here was posing first. So I would paint her with on an empty canvas where the other half was, I wasn't gonna do anything with the other half and then I had her for the four weeks, and then when the other model came for the next four weeks, I would paint that model. I would add her into the painting. And um, I would do like weird little test myself things, like I'd put this pencil down here, because you know it was like an interesting yellow compositional thing. I, I was doing eggs back then, because eggs are symbolic and stuff. 
Um, I love painting hands, so I would throw in a hand. And for some reason, and I can't tell you why, I put in a penis. I think I might take that out because it really does, just makes no sense. Um, I don't know if I was thinking this was a tree type thing and this was a branch, but uh, it doesn't belong there. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I'm going to take that out. But I loved how I painted this model here. This is Tanya. And, um, and I was also doing a lot of things with blue skies in the background because, you know, skies are, skies are whatever, ubiquitous. And uh, so like I would do that a lot where I would put together these little narratives and here's another one where I had Robert, who was area filmmaker, Tamika, who posed for my Venus painting much, much later and I think I captured her way, way better then. And then this was another pose where Robert posed. Um, and so I would just assemble these, these disparate people and hope that a narrative would emerge from me putting together these little these little human situations and it was also an excuse just to paint more hands more feet more people stuff more shoes more more of everything so going back looking at this painting for instance i think this is bothersome right here i would probably make make this straighter i think that that's not really a realistic how her leg was or maybe it was but it looks funny um, I love the shoes. I think that I had some fun with the shoes. Um, let me see what else. What else would I do? I'm glad I did this behind her, and I'm glad I didn't put any penises into this one. And um, oh, and look, he's even parked on a ball. This was way before Chick the Ball was even a gleam in my eye. But I like doing the spheres, so I think I put that instead of the you know the life drawing stool. And um, so yeah, that's my critique of that's my critique of these ones. Yeah, I even did furniture here. I I I'm happy. One of the things I did with the furniture here, I gave her the chair arm, and I just skipped the chair legs um, because that's just no fun, and I think it doesn't uh, it doesn't help it to have a bunch of chair legs in there. I I think that the the legs of the people in this surrealistic space kind of uh, you know. Kind of makes it good. So there's my critique of that. Now I'm going to take you down here to show you. Here I'm going to put this. I'm going to move these out of the way a little bit. Um, the pièce de résistance, or pre prepare you for the pièce de résistance. If you've been paying attention to the invitations and the my thing on my website and the you know the Facebook invitation. You know that there's a, a sort of a crazy picture of a pregnant woman with a bunch of weird tubes going on. Um, so I'm going to tell you about that. But in order to tell you about that, I have to take you back to the first Chicks with Balls painting that I ever painted. So this is the first Chicks with Balls painting that I ever painted. It's called Katie at eight and three quarter months blazed a trail. Blazed a trail meaning she was the first Chicks with Balls. Chick with Balls. Um, the, way, the way that this portrait came to be, back 2010 maybe, um, my friend, uh, artist friend Carol Medhurst and I paid for a model and we shared a model um, posing for us. It was her niece, Katie, who was pregnant, eight and three quarter months pregnant, very pregnant. We had her pose for us for a couple full day sessions, which is really very luxurious to have this model set up all day and you can just work on work from life and work for work on the model so when we had her posing all day in this sort of luxurious languishy kind of pose um i kept thinking how cool would it be for this to be a chicks with balls painting where you know i pictured her with her pregnant belly and her basketball you know holding basketballs and um so at the end of the posing session I got up my guts. This was the first time I'd ever done it. I didn't even have prototypes to show her. And I had to kind of 
scurry around and explain the right words and try to convince her that, you know, can she pose for chicks with balls? Can she hold these basketballs and show her belly? And, and this is about women of strength and courage. So like I did a lot of explaining and um, fortunately and luckily she said, sure, yeah, no biggie. So I was thrilled. I ran to the garage. I got some basketballs for her and I snapped maybe five or six pictures. Back then, this was the first time I had ever done a photo shoot for a painting. Um, and I didn't realize that like in later subsequent photo shoots, I would snap like anywhere between 75 and 300 photos, you know, just to get the right shot. But I just, you know, I felt like I was already impinging on her time too much. Um, so I was glad that she that she posed for you know with the with these uh, with the basketballs, and she ended up she was also you know as we painted her, getting to know her she was also a very ballsy outspoken woman so she really did kind of fit the whole fit the whole personality profile and I'm thrilled that she uh, she wanted to do it. Um, the one thing that I have not shown is the painting that we painted during the daytime like you know that we spent all day painting for several days uh, that led to me asking her for the for the chicks pose. So if you will follow me back to this area, I'm gonna show you the crazy painting that that I was working on. So we had her pose for several days. Um, and she was lounging on a couch and she was pregnant and we wanted to make sure she was comfortable. So, um, and after she left and I did take photographs while she was posing so that I would be able to work on it after she, after she went home. Uh, after she left, I also did a lot of embellishments to this painting. There's little bits of belief on it. Um, I, which, you know, is these, twisty, windy, umbilical cord kind of things. And then I even have this little fetus with the umbilical cord in the, in the background. Um, I called this painting Womb Dreams. And since there was orange in it, I threw an orange down there for no particular reason besides that I wanted to render a sphere. These umbilical cord swoopy things, I don't know if Mark, who's behind the camera, remembers I had him pose his hands because he had the most youthful hands in the family. Um, I had him pose his hands holding a, a round thing. It was like a rubber hose or something like that, or maybe a, a, a paper towel roll, uh, so that I could get the positions so that these little womb umbilical cord things would have hands holding them. Uh, so I think this is a very fanciful kind of cuckoo crazy composition and and whole idea it was kind of where the the concept was a little murky and the painting was I, I painted it basically I just wanted to add visual interest and test myself and do shadows and do you know like render these render these tubes that the tubes I, I made up because I didn't have umbilical cord tubes <laughs> um and the couch you know with the, the fabric and everything i i had to i had to render that and um so the concept was a little was a little murky like i said but it sort of it sort of emerged a little bit and and it's also one of those concepts where you ask the person well what do you think about it, it isn't something that i can sort of explain easily so um Concept and interest wise, I think it hits all the chart, the you know, hits all the marks. My criticism, and I'll tell you, I remember I repainted her head several times, and I wish that her head was just a little bit smaller. Her head just looks a little too big. I did different poses with her head, you know, while she was posing, I had her pose her head in different ways, and um, so that way I had a little bit of flexibility. Uh, I think that the first head wasn't an expression that I liked. Also, I feel like, because she is beautiful, she was a really very pretty, fun, nice looking, you know, woman. And I don't feel like I captured her beauty here. 
I don't feel like I really captured it much either in the in her chicks with balls portrait, but there at least there was sort of the joy. So I don't think I captured how pretty she actually is, um, which like people always say, oh, you certainly don't flatter people. I try to not flatter people, but I try to capture beauty. When there's beauty, I try to capture beauty. And I try to capture beauty in everybody, whether it's older people that have like tons of wrinkles, whether it's bigger people that have fat, whether it's skinny people that have a lot of bone structure, whether it, I, I try, I always try to capture beauty. So like if I haven't captured somebody's beauty, the painting isn't as good as I'd like it to be. Um, so I feel like that that's one, one of the flaws. Um, and maybe there's other, I'm trying to think what, what I would do differently. This arm is a little disconnected. It's kind of, you know, out in the, I mean, I think if I had it to do all over again, I probably would, would discontinue the arm here and not have the pillow cut it. That that's always a little problematic. Uh, but this is not a painting I'm going to go back into either because I do feel like it's a statement of where I was at that point and what I was doing at that point in time. And the um, this hand's really good. I love that and I love the belly. I think that 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 is really successful. I even love this this blue shadow that I did. Um, even though it's a little out of character with all the other shadows anywhere, but I think I remember struggling with the shadow color. Like I just couldn't get this, this shadow color here. I couldn't do it again. I don't know why I couldn't do it again. And um, because sometimes it's really hard to reproduce a color and especially back then, reproducing a color was always a problem for me. I'm not one to like be able to do the same thing over and over and over again. So, I think that that is my critique of this particular crazy womb dreams, womb dreams painting. And um, that brings me, brings me to the end of this week's show. Uh, be sure to tune in at seven o'clock on the Zoom for the, my uh, critique at the, at the Akron Society of Artists. And um, uh, like I said, all the the information for how to tune in on that is on my website, judytakis.com. You can do the Zoom login and everything. And then after that, be sure to join me next week when uh, on Liquid Living Figuratively, we're going to do the, it's called What's Cooking? The Art in the Kitchen. Um, so same bad time, same bad channel next Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And... Judge Judy declares court is adjourned.